Okay, we're going to talk quickly now about the nervous system, um, and uh, we're going to go over all of its different parts uh, so that we can get everything covered here today. My name's Kendall Wyatt. If you haven't seen any of these before, um, I am started out as a paramedic, became an RN. Now I'm uh, finishing up medical school, and I am the content director here at Picmonic, uh, making sure everything works good for you. Um, what's Picmonic? Everyone always asks. Well, we take fun characters. Everything you need to know in medical school and nursing school and turn it into fun characters that then help you keep everything straight in your brain. Keep the highs from the lows, the ups and the downs, um, and all the side effects of drugs and things straight. So if you need to remember warfarin, um, the drug warfarin becomes a war fairy here in Pygmonic. Um, and just to contrast, warfarin, everything you need to know for it, we have the contrasting hippie heron, that crazy bird, um, then uh, is for heparin to help you remember it with all the side effects and everything um, and how one's contraindicated in pregnancy, one's safe for pregnancy, and whatnot. Um, today, though, we're going to talk about nervous system disorders. Uh, we're going to talk through uh, uh, two different parts for nervous system disorders. Part, first part, we're going to talk about um, uh, Parkinson's disease. We're going to talk about myasthenia gravis. We're going to talk about multiple sclerosis. We're going to talk about Guillain Barre. And we're going to talk about Huntington's disease and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or Lou Gehrig's disease. Everything you see here today includes pieces, just parts, of, of our Picmonic learning system. Um, and uh, so you can always go to Picmonic.com and learn all of the details that go along with this and review anything that you see um, in, uh, that's characterized here today. So if you don't understand how it works, like Parkinson's disease becomes a park in sun garage. So you can associate that uh, with the Picmonic character as well. So for part two, we're going to talk about intracranial pressure. Um, intracranial pressure and the associations there. We are going to quickly touch on head injuries, and then we're going to talk about meningitis, um, or meningitis, and then we're going to talk about strokes, um, types of strokes, as well as uh, left and right hemisphere stroke assessment and knowing those um, one from the other. And that's really, really important, making sure you know the differences. So let's go and get started. Part one. So just so really, really quick to put everything together, um, I love to teach everything as a system. And I love to imagine that everything in the human body is this, is all goes together and works. And you obviously, as you know, you need to know all those compensation pieces. But um, we like to te I like to teach it as this big giant fish tank. Um, imagine that the human body is one big giant fish tank. You've got your tank, which is your body. You've got some pipes, which are the, the veins and arteries moving everything around, or in a fish tank, um, you know, the, the pipes moving the water around, recirculating the water. You've got to have a good pump to move the water or the blood around in your fish tank, and you've always got to have a good aerator to keep things alive, and that's exactly what the lungs do in the human body. They're constantly pumping oxygen into that, that fluid or blood. Um, we have to have the fluid to pump everything into. Of course, that's our blood or the water of a good fish tank. And to keep that water nice and clean, we have to have good filters. That's where the kidneys come in. Here's our kidney filters, just like you have to have a filter in a fish tank. Now, nothing can live inside your fish tank unless it has sustenance, and we like to have, show uh, fish food as the GI system. So you put in the food, it gets digested, and then um, it gets turned into energy. That energy can't be correlated without the nervous system itself, which is what we're going to talk about today. And that's kind of like the batteries or the electricity that keep everything firing and keep it all working in, in conjunction together. So here's just an example of how all of these systems go together. It's so important that you know how one system then compensates for the other or how they all work together in this beautiful system uh, that we like to call a wonderful fish tank with your beautiful fish or the human body. So let's get started on the actual nervous system. Uh, first, we're going to talk about Parkinson's disease. Now, Parkinson's disease, or a Parkinson garage, is probably the most uh, important nervous system disorder that I would say you have to just really have everything down for. One, it's it's a little complicated, but you just you're just really likely to get a lot of questions on Parkinson's disease because it is very common. Um, so, what's the cause for each one of these disorders? You kind of need to know what the cause is. What actually made the what caused the problem to happen? Um, which neurotransmitter is responsible or linked to the disease, and then knowing the signs and symptoms uh, and what's different. You know, just like I teach with every other disorder, um, you really need to know what is different about this one versus all of the others. So if they all um, have nausea and vomiting or they all have confusion, um, probably not something that you need to make sure you really focus in on. You need to know it, yes, and I believe it's important, but you need to focus in on the little details that are specific for each one. And Parkinson's just has to have a lot of them. So this is one er one. Um, subject that I see so many students always telling me they get select all that apply questions on and they always end up missing them. So let's talk about um, 
Parkinson's disease. So what's the actual main cause? What's going wrong? Well, it's a decrease of dopamine and slightly decrease in serotonin, but the main offender here is dopamine. And I always, um, right away, uh, we have this decreased Doberman, which we uh, represent for dopamine inside of Pygmonic. But where? And it's important that you remember the substantia nigra. Substantia nigra, as well as the basal ganglia, true, but most importantly, decreased dopamine in the substantia nigra. That's really uh, most likely what you're going to get. And what's important is you have to be able to identify this uh, patient, this particular, how they, how they present. And they present very classically. Um, and I'm just going to explain a lot of the signs and symptoms here really quick. Uh, the first thing is cogwheel rigidity. Mm, cogwheel. Well, you can see right here we've got this little cog drawn in this arm. And what does this really mean? Well, if you imagine that a cog it goes to a, a manufacturing plant and it's this giant thing that moves uh, things. Um, you know that there are gears that go together and those are very commonly called cogs and they then work together to do a systematic movement and, you know, moving things together. They raise things or move things or turn things. So what happens is they usually have to go, they have to fit perfectly together and they kind of this, um, uh, they have to align right and they're usually, they're usually not really smooth um, in their motions. Um, yes, newer ones are, of course, but we're talking, let's imagine like the, the most basic cog is if you were going to make one yourself. So if I were to take someone's arm like this and I had cog wheel rigidity, if I'm pushing the arm that way, um, pulling it down, I'm going to, you know, they're going to have, they're going to be very rigid and it's going to be very much like you are moving their arm like it's a, you know, it's a cog wheel. Like imagine that their elbow is a cog wheel and it's going to constantly just kind of uh, pull down or hard to move or straighten and it's more of a, you know, a rigid muscle type problem. And this all stems back to that decrease of dopamine. So what's next? So cogwheel rigidity, uh, muscle, you know, muscle stiffness is, is right. What's really important is this shuffling gait. And we show it here just as a shuffling gait. But what you need to know is that these patients, um, they, you know, they have a shuffling gait. What does that mean? What am I doing here? Well, if I'm actually walking and I imagine these two beautiful hands are two feet, um, the way they walk is they actually move their feet like this. They don't actually pick up and walk. They just shuffle, 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 shuffle. It's a little bit of a shuffling gait. So you're going to see them um, very often going very slow. And um, very often the term is bradykinesia. You know, they're very slow to get things moving, um, especially in the beginning. We're slow to get started. You know, kinetic is movement um, and kinetic injury is in energy is movement. And, uh, you know, you would Bradykinesia is a slow movement, so that's where you see that as well, especially when they get started. So here's uh, bradykinesia or this snail kite, bradykinesia, slow getting started. But even once they get started, I mean, they're like, uh, shuffle, 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 shuffle. It's not going to be a fast, they don't go anywhere very fast, usually, especially in later stages of the disease. Um, another classic sign symptom is this tremor at rest. So what does that really mean? Well, that means they're not moving at all right now and then they end up with a tremor. And that tremor is very classically defined as a pill rolling tremor. So it's like uh, the hand, if you imagine you put a pill between your two fingers or your three fingers, and you kind of rolled it like this, you know, you roll that pill, um, that's a pill rolling tremor. And they maybe just at rest have this little pill rolling tremor that they're going to have. Um, it's very classically like them. It's basically, it's important to remember that it's at rest. Because what kind of patient's going to have, um, or what's the term for a tremor that uh, occurs when you move? Um, when you move, well, I mean, one example is is an intention tremor. So this is somebody who goes to start to grab something, and they'll okay, so they're fine like this, and then they reach out to go grab something, and then they you know they they then start shaking as they try to grab something. That's more of an intention tremor. That's something we see in alcoholics. Uh, very often is, um, you know, along with, with other problems and liver, severe liver failure, late in stage liver failure, um, we see a lot of these, um, these other types of tremors. And um, there's also there's some other ones, we'll get to those. Uh, but um, this is a tremor at rest, and that's really important to remember that. And the last thing is this mask-like facies. Mask-like facies. So what does that really mean? I mean, does that mean they're wearing a mask like our image here? No, it means that they are having trouble. Um, they're the muscle, the little tiny muscles of their face um, also don't, um, they don't get started very easy, right? They're slow and they're not very reactive. They don't have this amazing flexibility to be able to move around. So what happens is they have trouble chewing, trouble swallowing, trouble speaking, and they end up with this mask-like face, 
Well, why does it look, why is it a mask like face? Why do they have this, you know, mask like face? Well, they don't really, they don't really show a lot of expression. So it looks like they're wearing a mask, you know, and you see a very classic picture in most of the textbooks, but they don't, you know, very unlike my expressive face, they're going to be very, um, very stoic. Um, they're not going to have a lot of expression in their face. And that, you know, that's why we call that mask like faces. It's a little different than a flat affect, but still along the same lines. It's, they're not actually able to show any, uh, show any expression, but it's because the, the muscles don't move. I like to compare it to somebody who just had a whole face full of Botox. They don't move. Nothing moves. Um, so I guess technically it could be a blessing in disguise, but I really doubt it. In case you've seen any of our other uh, series here, I like to drink from my Picmonic cup. I get in a wonderful 35 cents every time I drink from this thing. My um, mouth get, turns into sandpaper pretty quick, so I like to take a lot of drinks from my cup, mainly because I like all of those 35 cents. I just really wish they'd stop paying me in nickels here at Picmonic, but I think they really just enjoy doing that as well. So let's talk about treatments for Parkinson's disease. This is important too, especially the first one. And the big one, this is how we can just kind of associate the whole idea. If you memorize one thing for Parkinson's disease, and you say this Parkinson's garage, Parkinson's disease, um, what's the problem? Well, the, the main problem is a decrease in dopamine. Where? In the brain. Um, so this is decrease of dopamine, but where? In the substantia nigra, okay? So then what's a treatment for? What's the first line treatment or a main treatment for Parkinson's disease? The answer is levodopa, carbidopa. And we show it here as this levitating dopamine and this carpet dopamine. So levodopa, carbidopa is one of the treatments for Parkinson's disease. Very important to remember that. Now, how, why is this a combined drug? Do you know? Do you know why levodopa is combined with carbidopa? Why would we give two dopas? They're just dopa, dopa, dopa and all over the place over here, right? I mean, no? Well, the answer is uh, levodopa crosses the blood-brain barrier and turns into the active form of dopamine. Well, what happens is with, with carbidopa is carbidopa does not cause cross the blood-brain barrier. So carbidopa stays in the bloodstream, doesn't cross into the blood, but what it actually does is it keeps um, dopamine from being, it keeps the levodopa or any of the dopamine from being converted into the active form of dopamine. Because you should know dopamine as doing one, what, what important thing do you know dopamine is indicated for alone as a drug? Do you, can you remember? The answer is dopamine is a very powerful catecholamine. So it's a catecholamine that vasoconstricts and it increases blood pressure. It's, it's one medication that we can give, dopamine. But uh, it's very important that we don't overload. We only want to give patients, Parkinson's patients, dopamine in their brain. So we have to keep any kind of peripheral uh, conversion of dopamine from happening. And that's why this drug is combined with levodopa and carbidopa combined in the same drug. And that's really important. Um, there's a controversial uh, treat, you know, thing about taking a drug holiday from levodopa, carbidopa every now and then because you build up tolerance, um, and that's just something that uh, most textbooks have removed, um, and not something we're going to talk about really today. Um, so there are lots of other different drugs um, in the treatment of Parkinson's disease. There's uh, inticapone, in um, and it, what it, what does it do? It breaks down um, the, this enzyme COMT, um, it inhibits. Uh, COMT from breaking down dopamine. So if you think about, um, you know, there are lots of ways to get a replacement uh, neurotransmitter, right? We can either give the neurotransmitter direct, which is not very common. Um, we give a precursor that converts into the active form, which is common. And then the other one is to either stop what's there from being destroyed or to stop the body from be the, uh, from reabsorbing it. So either keep it from breaking down on its own or keep the body from basically breaking it down um, or, you know, reab reab reabsorbing it. So uh, this, and that's why we have these two different drugs here. So uh, it, COMT is something that breaks down uh, dopamine in the brain. And also um, we give the medication selegiline. Now selegiline is interesting to know because it's an MAOI. And in what type of MAOI? It's a type B. So all the other MOI, MAOIs, or monoamine oxidase inhibitors are type A. Um, this is a type B, so it's different. It doesn't have as many effects, side effects um, that you need to know about, but um, it prevents breakdown of dopamine. Um, just another important little tidbit there. Just some other medications to prevent some 
other side effects. Um, there's amantadine, which is actually an antiviral. Um, the mechanism of action, why it works for the side effects is unknown, but it's actually an antiviral drug um, not really used, but just used sometimes in the treatment of Parkinson's um, as an ancillary treatment. Um, the other one is benzotropine or benztropine. I always end up saying that wrong. It's one of my one of one of the worst ones I have to, to ever say correctly. Uh, that and some monoclonal antibodies, which we'll talk about it in immunology. But um, so benzotropine, it's an anticholinergic drug. Yes, we give it for the the trimmer basically, because this trimmer, you know, this constant trimmer can get pretty severe in these patients, especially in later stages of the disease. So what other scenario do you know we give the drug benzotropine or benztropine? Hmm. Do you know what the other one? What's another indication? Well, you should be thinking immediately psych, right? We're going to think about. Uh, psych, but not necessarily giving to psych patients, but we give it to treat what side effect? Well, we give it to treat um, EPS symptoms like dystonias um, and uh, muscle type muscle type uh, side effects. So you can just remember that right there. Um, you know, it's it's really important to for dystonias and whatnot uh, to keep those keep those side effects at bay if they're taking antipsychotic medications uh, for those EPS symptoms like Hal Haldol and chlorpromazine. So that's keep track there. They can, I'm gonna get a I'm gonna get enough to where I can get a check one of these days instead of getting nickels. So we talked about lots of drugs. We talked about the treatment. You must know Parkinson's disease. So if you don't have it, you need to learn it. You can go into Pygmatic Learning System and go through every single one of these, and they're gonna tie it all in so you can remember this forever. And you must remember it forever. It's very very important. <clears throat> Every time we get any patient that has muscle weakness, you should immediately be thinking about safety. Um, this is just a, this needs to be ingrained into that nursing brain of yours. It should be way deep down in there. You must always think about safety. Uh, fall safety, aspiration risk safety, right? Um, so aspiration risks, we worry about these people and their diet. Now a speech therapist would essentially uh, decide their diet, but we need to be worried and aware of thickening liquids, um, aspiration risk, you know, and, and giving them assisted, assistive measures to be able to, so that they can eat um, and swallow. Um, also, just a fall risk. So, and a home assessment, giving edu proper education, all the education for fall precautions, very, very, very important um, as well. So, next we're going to talk about Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease. Uh, so, uh, Huntington's disease, this is actually a demo picmonic that we have from our system just to kind of show you how each one goes together. And I'm just going to talk you through it um, so that you can have it right here in the system. So Huntington's disease, you can remember it because of this hunter, um, this hunter hunting, Huntington's disease. It's an autosomal dominant um, disease shown here as these dominoes. And that's just the pattern of inheritance that it follows, which means uh, that, that it's actually a pretty prevalent disease as well. Um, now, the, what's the actually wrong? And this is really important for you to know. What is going wrong in Huntington's disease? Huntington's disease is not super high yield, but what's what's the fundamental problem? The problem is a decrease, excuse me, a decrease of uh, GABA. G-A-B-A, -A, shown here as this GABA goose. And what does GABA do? And it's also a decrease, um, a decrease of uh, acetylcholine as well. But um, what does GABA do? What does GABA really do? Well, GABA is like a controller. I like to think about it, um, if you think about all these pathways in the brain, um, and I'm generalizing this for you, so you know, if, you're, if you are way up on the, the, the details, you can appreciate how this needs to be very simplified, just to understand the idea of what's going on. Uh, so what happens is we pretty much have uh, GABA and dopamine um, that are kind of in this constant, beautiful balance. And they have two different pathways um, in the brain um, that work to uh, work through the brain to create this balance of, of movement. Um, so there's always, um, you know, dopamine, which says, move, 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 muscle. And then there's GABA, which says, don't, 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 um, you know, don't move. Well, what happens is when you need to initiate a movement, these two work in balance so that this movement is coordinated and smooth and you're able to just easily, quickly grab something and make these nice, fluid, fluid nice movements, right? So I'm making these fluid movements. Yay. But what happens with um, when I have a decrease of GABA, if I, if I don't have enough GABA, my movements are very over-exaggerated and they're not smooth. 
Um, so this decrease of GABA, I can't control or hold back the motion. So what happens is you end up with these choreiform movements, and that's really important. Um, choreiform movements. Well, what's a choreiform movement? Well, it just means that um, it looks like it's choreographed. So it means that it looks like it's like been made to do that. They're not doing it on purpose. But let's just give an example. If I'm going to move, up, reach over here to grab something, um, let's say I'm going to reach over to grab my cup uh, for hunting disease, and I want to show you how choreiform movements work. So they would, it would be very over exaggerated and look like it's like it's um, moved. And this happens a lot when they walk. Um, they'll have these. Uh, core, you know, very, uh, very jerky movements when they go to get things. Um, it's very important. It's important to know with with Huntington's disease. It's an interesting one. Males are usually affected more, but um, so not only that, but it also um, it usually doesn't appear until about age forty. So it has a late a, a late onset of, of or appearance of the disease. Um, so it it um, it's just because of the the type of um, genetic abnormality that it is, but it appears later in life. So they're normal, these patients are completely normal until they, you know, later on in life, 40 years old, they have start having symptoms of this disease, and they do ha are affected cognitively. And it kind of uh, uh, progresses in stages um, until they, you know, they have a initial beginning problems, and then it kind of goes through these three stages of slow cognitive decline and, and increasing problems with these movements. Um, so what's the treatments for Huntington's disease? Uh, well, we give neuroleptics, um, antipsychotics, basically, um, haloperidol and uh, ris uh, uh, risperidone for, um, as neuroleptics. But the only true medication that's actually indicated to treat Huntington's disease is te tetrabenazine. Uh, tetrabenazine is the only medication. So if you have trouble memorizing Huntington's disease, you can easily go into the picmonic system and view everything in here and all of the important information to remember that it's that down arrow GABA goose and down arrow acetylcholine. So that you can always remember it and keep it straight. Next, we're going to talk about Gillian Bure. Gillian Bure is an interesting one because it um, it's not one we I believe we know a whole lot about. Uh, but what we do know is it it comes on on after a viral or bacterial illness and. Um, there's a lot more specifics which what type and type of bacteria, and we're not going to go in that, so beyond the scope of this today. But what you need to know, the important things are it causes and it shows this ascending paralysis. So it's a paralysis that, in, that begins in the feet and the toes or down low and then ascends up in the body so they get more and more paralyzed as, the, as, the, um, as it progresses. So if I'm thinking about this progressing all the way up, at what point, what involvement am I worried about with... Gillian Beret. What am I going to be worried about? What is it? That's right. I'm always worried about respiratory support. Oh, sorry, I went ahead. Um, and I worry about that paralysis of the diaphragm, and that's what we worry about. Because if you stop breathing, um, you're not going to stay alive, and that's something we can ventilate you and put you on a ventilator and definitely keep you alive. Gillian Beret um, resolves within a couple of months to a year or so, and um, pretty much patients usually don't have any res you know, residual deficits most often, um, but it's pretty much um, supplemental treatment for that. Um, <clears throat> the next one we're going to talk about, the next disease we're going to talk about is ALS, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. Now, everyone's heard about ALS these days. ALS, ALS, ALS. And if I hear one more ice bucket challenge story, I think I'm going to puke. Thank God they're not even out there anymore. But Google it. You can find lots of them. If you were, lived in Iraq for the last two years, um, Google ice bucket challenge, and the, you're just going to be in, stuck in it for hours. However, um, most people don't actually know what happens with ALS, and it's actually a really sad disease. So what happens with ALS is um, that uh, you end up with a systemic muscle wasting. So it usually starts in the hands. Um, usually patients have this hand weakness. Um, hand weakness It usually starts, appears in the hands and then progresses to the systemic muscle weakness of the entire body. And it's a very sad disease because these patients um, have no change in cognitive decline whatsoever. Um, they are completely lucid and they know everything that's going on up until the day they die. Now, just as... Um, you know, the uh, things we talked about before, like with Gillian Bray, the difference here in ALS is um, this does not ever resolve. There is no cure or treatment for ALS that stops the disease. 
Um, there's only rilazole, which is a treatment which um, treats symptoms of the disease and some a weakness. Um, the other thing you usually see is uh, fasciculations and spasticity. And I just, I always like to explain a lot of medical terms just so you know um, what they are. But fasciculations um, are just like a muscle twitch. And I always get this daggone twitch right here in this muscle under my eye every single couple of weeks. And it drives me nuts. And it pretty much just starts twitching and twitches and it twitches until I just want to kill myself with a stick or something right there. Just just make it stop. But that's a fasciculation. It's pretty much just like a muscle twitch. Uh, but that's what you need to know. As far as ALS itself, what's important to know about the treatment or what's important to know about these patients is that eventually they're just going to become progressively and more progressively weak until what happens. Well, what's going to happen is they need respiratory support. So you can see these lungs being supported by these um, uh, scaffolding you think about respiratory support. You've got to remember that. And it's really sad because these patients don't recover. Once they go on the ventilator, I mean, they never really, they never come off. I mean, they have to um, always be ventilated then because their muscles are too weak to essentially, um, uh, to, to breathe normally. So they never really reverses um, as well. So it's just a really sad disease because these people, patients are aware the entire time of what's going on. So often they, they know as this disease progresses over several years and they set up things, um, you know, end of life treatments and things like that as well. Just going to take a little drinky roo here. So the next thing, myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia gravis is another really um, high yield disease that you just have to be able to know what it is. And what do I mean, Kendall? What do you mean know what it is? Well, just know it, okay? Just do it. Just do it. I said so. Stop asking questions. Just do it, right? I mean, that was simple. Just do it. All right. So what do we really mean? Now, of course, I'm going to tell you, but I'm going to string you along just for a minute. What actually happens in myasthenia gravis? What's the underlying cause? The underlying cause is uh, myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease. What does it mean by autoimmune? And I always use the same example, but it's pretty much imagining that the body is somehow attacking itself. That's not very nice. I mean, hello, body. Why are you attacking yourself, you stupid idiot? That's not very nice. But there's tons of autoimmune diseases. And what happens is, I just assume, one part of the body gets ticked off at the other part, and it just goes at it. Um, and I just wish that these parts of the body would be a lot nicer to one another, personally. But uh, it just doesn't happen that way. So let's imagine that my left hand here gets mad at my right hand, and they get into a fight. Well. When they get into a fight, they just go at it until either they get broken up and they, and they get a treatment or they just keep going at it and something happens. Somebody gets beat up and somebody gets their feelings hurt. That's not very nice either. Right hand gets, gets a lot of... Anyway, we'll just leave him alone. He's, he's, um, he's a sore loser, let's put it that way. So myasthenia gravis. What's important here? It's autoimmune. It's an autoimmune disease against... It's a, antibodies. These antibodies are against the uh, acetylcholine receptor. Uh, so what, what do we know about acetylcholine? Well, acetylcholine is um, important in muscle action, right? Um, the m action of muscles. That's really important to know. Um, and this is actually, you know, in the neurons firing. I'm not going to go into the details of this as well, but maybe I'll go into it a little separate in a you know separate breakout video for you. So antibodies against the acetylcholine receptor. And what you need to know is that, let's say there are 100 um, uh, receptors for this muscle. So there are 100 receptors for this muscle, and these are all attached on, are attached to in the process of making one muscle move. So if there's 100 um, receptors, myasthenia gravis, the autoimmune antibodies, will attach to, let's say, 50 of them. So they just take those 50 and they're useless. There's antibodies bound onto them, and they're not going to be activated by acetylcholine. Well, what's interesting is that the 50 that are left, um, they can get, you know, there's so much free acetylcholine, and they can bind to those to get some muscle action. Um, so you still have muscle, you know, use. Well, what's interesting is if, you're, if you know anything about working out, which I do not, I despise working out, I'd rather lay on my couch all night and eat, I can't say that word, eat some brand name foods that are nice. Almost got me. So um, 
But what's important here is over time, I mean, if you work out, you need more and more and more to keep going, right? I mean, you just can't keep running and you just like keep using only half of the muscles. The idea of exercising is that you end up working the whole muscle and you need more and more and more to keep going. And what that is, is you need more and more um, re uh, acetylcholine receptors to, to bind acetylcholine. So this is how this actually works. And this is where um, over time you end up with weakness um, with muscle use because half of the receptors are blocked off. So what kind of muscle do you think is used all the time in every single day or at least that Kendall uses every single day, um, that might become weak. And let me give you a couple of examples. Right there's one example. My mouth never shuts up. I talk so much. If I had myasthenia gravis, I wouldn't be able to get out three words after 15 minutes. I talk nonstop. It's, it's a gift. I mean, it, it takes a lot of skill to talk this much. But um, with myasthenia gravis, the, the things that you use the most, your lips, talking, like, you know, swallowing, and one of the really important is ptosis or lid lag. So your eyelids just start drooping. It's in, you know, we also call it setting sun sign, but it's pretty much the eyelids, they're just, uh, just kind of tired, man, just tired, tired all the time. But they're not actually tired, but they have their, their, their eyelids are tired and they, you know, they don't know what's going on. Um, and this, this is a sign that they have myasthenia gravis and that um, they're having issues. Dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, is a biggie. And the number one thing we worry about with these particular patients. So, what do we do for myasthenia gravis patients? What's the treatment for an autoimmune disease? I don't know. Probably steroids, right? Probably. And we're going to talk about that in a sec. So the next thing that I find, the reason this is so important to talk about myasthenia gravis, it's a very difficult concept to understand, is... Um, what test do we use to diagnose myasthenia gravis? This is a very high yield. Hmm. Well, the answer is the Tensilon test. That is correct. So you remember the Tensilon test, and I'll be honest, I actually don't know. Tensilon is actually the trade name of the drug edrophonium, which is the drug that's used during the Tensilon test. So I don't actually know if the NCLEX would call it the edrophonium test, but um, I'm assuming they would still use the Tensilon test. I honestly don't know that, um, and I don't know anybody that I could call to actually find the answer, but if I do, I will update this accordingly so that you know. But with the Tensilon test, what are we doing? What we're going to find out whether, is it eventually, we're, we're going to, essentially, we're identifying what's called a myasthenia, myasthenia crisis or a cholinergic crisis. I get tongue-tied sometimes by the end of this. Um, and I just blame it on myasthenia gravis. And everyone just feels sorry for me. They don't know what's going on. So what you need to do with these is you need to think of the name of what's going on in the name, which piece, and that's going to tell you where the problem is. So if I have a cholinergic crisis, I have, the problem is too much cholinergics, too much medication. If I have a myasthenic crisis or mice with thin eyes, as we show here, um, myasthenia is exacerbated. I'm having a disease problem. The disease is running amok. Or I don't have enough medication to treat me. I mean, that's where you need to think about that. Um, so cholinergic crisis is a problem with um, way too much cholinergics and way too much cola, as we show here, too much medication. And um, a myasthenic crisis is the problem is myasthenia. So I, the disease is just running amok. Um, and it's just, I don't have enough medication. I need to get some medication to get myself in check. So what's the treatment? Uh, we already said the Tensilon test, or edrophonium, right? So how does it work? Well, we just talked about myasthenia gravis, what's going on with those acetylcholine receptors. Um, and we talked about um, cholinergics and everything. But let's talk about, uh, really quick, just this Tensilon, this edrophonium. Edrophonium is a short-acting, it doesn't last very long, uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. Now, a little, little secret here. I don't know if anybody filled you in on this little nugget of information, but any time you see something that ends in A-S-E, what does that mean? Just give yourself a temporal massage there if you can't, if you can't quite remember it. If it ends in A-S-E, that's right, it's probably some type of enzyme, which means it breaks down something. 
um, and that's what you need to remember. So if I'm giving an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, this is a, a what? That's right, it's an enzyme that prevents, that breaks down acetylcholine, but I'm gonna inhibit the enzyme. So it's an inhibitor of an enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. Does that make sense? So are you gonna end up with more acetylcholine or less? I'm gonna end up with more acetylcholine. So if I have an ACE on the end, that means it's gonna break down whatever the, pre, the, the, the original part is, the first part of the word. So an ACE, acetylcholine esterase, is a, something that breaks down acetylcholine. But if I inhibit that, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop breaking down acetylcholine. So I'm gonna end up with tons of acetylcholine. And that's what you need to think about this. And you can always kind of use root words and drug end or endings of things to really help you along, to just kind of give you a clue in on what's going on. So it's an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, so let's talk about then what's happening. So I give this edrophonium. I give, I remember I had my 100 um, receptors, my 100 acetylcholine receptors. I mean, that's all I got, right? Imagine we only have 100, just for the sake of making this an easy example. 50 of them are blocked by these daggone autoimmune antibodies. Mean suckers. And we're going to get them. We're going to get them. I just don't know how yet. So if they're blocked, then that means I've got 50 free ones. Well, the one of the ways that I could pretty much make all 50 of those get bound to is if I have a whole bunch of acetylcholine. And the way to get a whole bunch of acetylcholine is to give an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, which stops the breakdown of acetylcholine, which immediately um, makes more acetylcholine free. So what happens when I give this test? If I give, if I give edrophonium and these patients start feeling like they got some more muscle use, right? They're, they've got muscle use. What's going on? Well, that's a positive test. That means that these patients responded, they responded to the increase in acetylcholine. So if they had an increase in acetylcholine and they were able to move their muscles better, an, an improvement, that means that's a myasthenic crisis or um, they were under medicated or they have myasthenia gravis, right? That's the diagnostic tool. But if I gave edrophonium, to a patient who, and then they didn't have an increase in muscle strength, or they have even more spasticity of their muscles, that means they have already got too much acetylcholine, and now we've got even more. So then what happens? Well, that's a cholinergic crisis, or too much medication. So those people need their medication scaled back. So hopefully that was a good example there for you, so you could really just understand exactly what's going on. Next, we're going to talk about multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is an important disease that you need to know, um, and you really just have to understand what's going on. So let's talk about multiple sclerosis. What is actually going on? Well, it's destruction of the myelin sheath, um, nerve fiber demyelination. And the, the myelin sheath, a sheath is something that goes over top of. Um, it's kind of the cover. And what does the myelin do in the nerves? Well, it kind of just lets... I kind of like to explain it like a freeway. I mean, it's kind of the thing that just allows the nerve uh, conduction to go even faster all the way down. Um, but if you destroy the myelin, it's like putting a bunch of potholes in the road. Nobody likes potholes. Potholes make me angry, like really angry. Like if I had a, I just let's not. We're not going to go there. But so, just gather my thought here nerve fiber demyelination. So if I put a bunch of potholes on the nerves, not only are those impulses going to be angry, but they're not going to go smoothly across the nerves or they're not going to make it at all. And the classic thing about multiple sclerosis is what? What's a couple, what's a classing, classic defining feature of multiple sclerosis? Yes, it's common in women um, and it's common usually in ages 20 to 50 and you can remember that here is this um, wonderful 50 character with these two, um, two women here. What's important is that it has this relapse and remitting um, feature. So they may end up with this uh, relapse. They may be okay for a while, and then it just remits. The whole thing comes back. Um, and then they have these you know, exacerbations of uh, multiple sclerosis. So, I mean, you could end up with multiple sclerosis. You could be diagnosed at 25, and you could go years and years and years with multiple sclerosis, with multiple motor issues. And these people have you know, problems, you know, motor issues, and little um, spasticity problems. Um, and another common thing, which um, someone pointed out to me, and I just want to make sure I mentioned, it's not as important for the nursing level, but an optic neuritis. Um, so they end up with this, you know, optic disc, uh, they end up with optic neuritis and inflammation of the nerve. 
um, in the eye as well. It's just something you can see, just kind of a something to memorize, and we've got it inside of our pygmonic. Um, but it's something that's really commonly not diagnosed, and we don't catch it right away um, because it's uh, it's really just someone comes in and they've got these muscle twitches, and not usually something we go for right away um, as far as a diagnosis. So what's the treatment for this autoimmune or this um, multiple sclerosis, which is a nerve fiber demyelination, which is another autoimmune type disease? Well, corticosteroids or quarter on steroids is a good treatment, right? Yes, the answer is always yes. And I'm just going to mention these other treatments. We have a whole pygmonic to help you remember all, remember all these, but these are some other treatments um, and, immu and immunomodulator drugs that will help you remember some other treatments of multiple sclerosis. So there's interferon beta. We got this beta fish here. Uh, dimethyl fumarate, which is another good one. Uh, fingolimod, which is another, the finger mob here. Uh, Metoxantrone, the mitten xylophone, and natalizumab. And remember I was talking about those monoclonal antibodies and how much fun they are. Natalizumab. Say that ten times fast. I'm not going to spare you that one today. So you can go and remember all these inside of our Pygmonic Learning System. Remember all these characters to keep them all together, and I highly recommend it because you're probably going to get some weird question about Fingolimod, and I for I'm sorry if you do. But um, I don't know that any of them aside from corticosteroids are particularly the highest to know, the most important. Um, but multiple sclerosis is a pretty common uh, disease to get tested on, so it's nice to know kind of these weird new treatments um, that might be out there. Okay, so now we're going to talk about part two of the nervous system and everything you need to know regarding the nervous system. We're going to move on to more diseases um, so that we can cover everything uh, for you today. So welcome to part two of the nervous system. If you haven't, didn't see part one, that's the one that's before the number two. Uh, here I am educating you every single moment of the hour. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first, I want to talk about intracranial pressure. Intracranial pressure is very, very important or ICP. Um, this is really important for you to understand and make sure that you have this concept nailed down. It's very likely that you're going to get um, intracranial pressure as a topic on your exams. Um, I like to choose that as a topic every single uh, point when I can. And uh, what do we actually know about intracranial pressure? Um, intracranial pressure is uh, basically an increase in pressure in the cranium. Ah, I got you there, didn't I? Yeah teaching you good things. So uh, what do we look for? Well, the big thing we look for, it's, uh, it's called Cushing's triad. Um, and uh, first off, do you know what a normal intracranial pressure is? A normal intracranial pressure. Hmm. Normal intracranial pressure, let's use a rough, uh, rough number and we're going to say it's about 10 to 20. Um, that's a good rough range to know. I, I know there's different um, books uh, definitely measure different uh, different ranges, but 10 to 20 is a good range to really remember, and it's a good solid range. Um, if you get anything really outside of that, you should know. Of course, we're worried about increased intracranial pressure. Anything above 20, 22 um, is going to be what you're worried about to, you know, as far as increased. So what do we see? What do we see with patients with increased intracranial pressure? Think about it to yourself. Well, I've got it right here on the screen for you, of course. Uh, the big thing is Cushing's triad. Um, this Cushing's guy has everything named after him, and it gets so confusing. Um, so what we want to really remember here, I try not to remember Cushing's triad personally because I think it's really difficult to remember with the other um, things going on uh, that are all named Cushing. But uh, Cushing's triad, the big one is um, irregular breathing. Um, so this increased intracranial pressure causes this obviously increased pressure. Um, and then you end up with uh, this pressure causing an irregular breathing pattern. Usually, most often, um, you know, decreased respirations, but it's definitely very irregular and sporadic. Um, the other thing you're going to find is bradycardia. Um, why bradycardia? Well, bradycardia happens because the body is trying to decrease the pressure that's pumping up to the top to the upstairs. So it's trying to drop the pressure, and the way it drops the pressure is decreasing the number of pumps that's pumping the pressure upstairs. Um, and that's really an easy way to think about it. Um, the other thing is um, widening pulse pressure. Now, do you know what widening or what a pulse pressure is? What is a pulse pressure? Ask yourself. You should know this one. Well, what it is, just think about it. Think about it right now, pulse pressure. So if I take my little hand here and I take my other little hand and they're working together at the moment and I then measure my own pulse, I want you to imagine the pulse pressure is the difference in between no beat and then a beat. So it's essentially the pulse pressure. It's the amount of pressure to create a pulse, which is essence 
um, a, di a difference between the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure. So it's the difference. So if you had a blood pressure of 160 over 100, that's pretty high, right? Yes. What's the pulse pressure? Well, the answer is 60. It's the difference of the two. So it, you'd have a pulse pressure of 60. So a widening pulse pressure is essentially an increasing pulse pressure. So the heart is beating harder, but then relaxing more, or um, you know, it's creating a, a high, an increased pulse pressure um, as well. And it's another mechanism to try to decrease the amount of um, pressure that's being pumped upstairs to the cranium, because it's trying to reduce all this pressure. Now, with sustained hypertension or increased ICP, we see this papilledema, which is a swelling of the optic disc. It can only be seen um, with an ophthalmoscope actually looking in the eyes. But what is the number one classic thing that I have seen way too many times? And that's projectile vomiting. Now, I have a story for you, and this is one of my favorite stories. I love all my stories, but this one has a special place right here in my heart. I had a patient when I used to work EMS, and this patient had fallen off of a roof. A little older man fell off a roof, landed on his head, and he um, had spinal shock and definitely had, a, we suspected, an, a head injury and increased intracranial pressure. And this guy raised his head up and vomited, and it vomited from the ambulance cot all the way and hit the back of the ambulance door. Projectile vomiting. I'm not talking just like a little baby, blah, 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 at your stomach. I'm talking like bleh, projectile vomiting. Forceful vomiting is a really big indicator that you have an increased intracranial pressure. Um, and, you know, there are other things like uh, different pupil sizes, paradoxal pupil sizes as well. But the big thing um, is uh, this projectile vomiting and then Cushing's triad, bradycardia, widening pulse pressure, and irregular breathing. Breathing pattern is the big one, uh, this breathing ataxia. I don't know if you've seen any of the webinars before, but uh, uh, every time I take a drink from my cup, I get 35 cents. So I'm saving up uh, lots of nickels right now because they pay me here at and nickels. And uh, I'm going to buy a new bicycle or something um, with all of my nickels for sure. Uh, definitely not anything too nice, but I'm working on it. So here we can see all of our Picmonic characters to help you remember this. And the other thing I want to mention here is posturing. Um, posturing is a important concept, but it's another sign of a spinal injury or a you know neural injury or increased in intracranial pressure as well. And what are the two types of posturing? So what type of posturing do we have displayed right here in this little image here in the bottom? What type of uh, posturing is there? Hmm. Well, that's decerebrate posturing. Decerebrate posturing. So it's a way. So it's kind of hard to tell on, on what we've got on our screen today, but I'm going to teach you the two types. So the first type is decorticate, um, and I want you to remember decorticate posturing as towards the cord. Towards the cord. Decorticate. Ah, see there? I am like blowing your mind right now. It's okay. It's fine. I understand. Happens to everyone. So towards the cord. So towards the spinal cord is a towards the cord. The towards the cord, the posturing. So towards the cord, right? The cerebrate is away. So usually the arms actually go down, much like I've got here in this image. Um, so they go down, and they're away. So it's away from the cord, uh, the cerebrate. And usually um, um, away from the cerebellum uh, is another way to remember that. But if you remember one, the other one's the other one. You can easily remember one, and then you know the other one is the opposite. So if you can remember towards the corticate, the cord, towards the cord, then you have the corticate, and you can just easily remember the other one is uh, the cerebrate. It's away from the cord. Um, and that's just all you got to remember. Now, this is a priority, uh, really common priority question. What do we do for in increased intracranial pressure? What do we do? Do we hang them from their feet from a tree? I mean, the only time I want to be hanging from a tree is when the zombies come and I get in my sleeping bag that hangs from a tree and no one's going to get me. And I'm going to be up there until the zombie invasion is over. And I know it's coming and you think I'm crazy, but this, this is, I'm going to, it's going to work. And I have a sleeping bag and it hangs from a tree and you're judging me right now, but trust me, it's, you, you We'll see, just, we'll see who gets the laughing matter in the end there. But anyway, so we don't want to hang people with increased intracranial pressure from a tree. I mean, that's not a good idea. We want to elevate the head. So if we elevate the head, we know if we've, we've brought them up, sit a patient up, so that helps them breathe, right? But that's not a priority here. The priority here is to decrease the amount of blood that's rushing up to the head. So we elevate the head. That simple thing is what you would always do first in any of these types of patients. It's so simple. But people always miss the easy stuff, and you need to not miss the easy stuff because you're listening to me, and that's really good. Next thing we want to do is we want to do, um, met, we may give them a medication. Um, there are two, um, the medication that we really want to think about is mannitol. Um, and we've got our manatee, mannitol character right here, mannitol, manatee. 
um, a character inside of Pygmonic. But the big thing is you give mannitol. Now it's an osmotic diuretic, and that's really important um, because it decreases fluid. And if we decrease, if we give you a diuretic that decreases free water, then relatively we're going to decrease intracranial pressure, which is an increase in fluid as well. Now it's a little bit controversial. Um, it's not really indicated any longer, but you're still going to see it in a lot of textbooks. Um, for any kind of neurogenic shock or ICP, um, we give dexamethasone, which is a steroid, and we've got our dex moth here to help you remember that. Um, but you know, it's definitely uh, used to be a first-line treatment, any kind of spinal injuries. It's not so much that we give steroids anymore, um, but there's still some schools of thought and a debate on it. We're not really going to go into the whole debate on whether it's really right or wrong today, but just know that that's a possibility. The big things you're going to see are elevate the head of the bed, right? And, you know, reduce straining. We don't want these people straining in any way. Um, anything that's going to increase uh, pressure at all inside the body cavity is a no-no. So you probably don't want anybody with increased intracranial pressure, riding a roller coaster. Ah, okay. I mean, you know, all my patients always ride roller coasters inside the hospital. If they're, if they're my patient, we know they're probably having some kind of roller coaster, but it's usually just putting up with me. The next topic I want to talk about is meningitis. Now, this is really important um, that you know meningitis, uh, mainly because I just like the character inside of meningitis for meningitis. Now, the good thing about this one is we're going to run you through our actual picmonic, much like uh, it is designed in our learning system to show you exactly how you would learn to keep all of these facts together with meningitis. Now, we know meningitis, um, just think about it, it means men meninges inflamed, meningitis. So meningitis assessment, you can always remember because of these men in tights right here inside of picmonic land. Um, you, can always, you, know, you need to understand that patients with meningitis may have nausea and vomiting, shown by this Weird vomit here, nausea and vomit. Remember projectile vomiting because they also may have a fever. Here you can remember um, a fever for fever beaver. Patients with meningitis very often present with a fever. Um, the other thing is nuchal rigidity. We're going to talk about this just a little bit more in a second, but nuchal rigidity. So, you know, rigidity in the neck. And you can remember that here as these brass knuckles inside of pygmonic. And of course, um, with meningitis, you're going to remember a severe headache. Um, and this is the same for increased intracranial pressure. And I think that a lot of these things myself are like, you know, they're gemmies. Uh, but if I don't mention it, then I find students end up coming in and they say, oh, you didn't mention that. And, you know, we did, um, you know, and we don't mention everything. We hope that you, we're hoping you tie the concepts in and put the things together in your brain. And we're just here to augment that experience. Um, the other thing you might find in these patients is purpura. So it's um, uh, purpura is a, a skin uh, discoloration that you may find, shown by our purple cat. Um, a really common uh, thing we find in increased intracranial pressure or meningitis as well is seizure, shown here as Caesar, uh, because uh, that's a really common uh, finding. Another thing with meningitis, also because of this headache, you're also gonna find photophobia. Um, and you can remember this afraid of the light character here um, in adults. Now, when you move to children, children or infants, um, you know, when we do a newborn assessment, we assess the fontanelles, right? And we assess for a bulging fontanelle or a soft fontanelle. We want the, the fontanelle to be soft and non-bulging, but also we don't want it to be sunken. Because if it's sunken, what does that mean? Well, a sunken fontanelle means dehydration. A bulging fontanelle would mean over fluid overload or increased intracranial pressure, which is a no-no. We want it to be nice and soft, uh, but we don't want to stick our finger in there either because we know that there's no bone there, right? I mean, we want to don't be, don't be too crazy. Don't, don't say Kendall said. So newborns um, or infants, they have uh, what's called the opisthotonous position. And the opisthotonous position is really, um, we've got it here shown as this, um, this pistol body. But essentially, it's, it's a rearing back. It's a rearing back like this, a rearing back of the neck. And they kind of turn into this, um, this arched back uh, pistol position. So we've actually got it shown here for you um, with this opisthotonous baby on top of this little pistol. Uh, and the other thing that you will never be able to get out of your brain is with a baby with increased intracranial pressure is that they have this high-pitched, shrill cry. And when I say shrill, I've only heard it once, but you won't unhear, you, know, you can't unhear that. Um, it's definitely something that would just run the tingle down your spine for a really high-pitched, thrill, uh, uh, sh shrill uh, cry. Shrill cry, shrill cry, I can't say a word. And the last thing, which I already said, was a bulging fontanelle, and uh, because of an increased intracranial pressure or fluid overload, which leads to um, intracranial pressure as well, 
Um, but uh, you see this uh, bulging fontanel, this fountain bulging out of the fontanel of this little cute little itsy bitty baby right here inside of Picmonic. Um, so definitely, here's how you can easily remember everything inside of uh, that you need to know inside of all of the topics, and you can always understand where you need to be and what you need to learn. That's really important as you go forward. There are two signs that you may need to know um, as part of your assessment, and those are Brudzinski's sign. Brudzinski's sign. Brudzinski's sign. What is Brudzinski's sign? Do you know? Think to yourself, Brudzinski's sign. Well, Brudzinski's sign, we were just talking about nuchal rigidity, right? So, um, Brudzinski's sign is when you take someone's head and you push it down and you push, you push the head down so that their chin is on their chest, right? And you have their knees um, flexed, you know, they're slightly flexed, and you push their, their chin down um, to touch their chest. What happens is this causes a tug. Um, so if I, I like to use my shirt as an example, not only because I really like this shirt, um, just because it works as a good example. So if I look right here, um, and I'm, imagine that this shirt is the meninges, right? Actually, this shirt's really tight. I need to lose some weight. Um, so I got this shirt. So here's the shirt, and it's kind of, see how it's nice and wrinkly? Now, if I bend my neck down, and I imagine that this is my meninges and my spinal cord, and I pull it like this, it causes this to be really tight, right? Um, it causes it to be really tight, so this is really taut right now. And that's exactly what happens um, with the spinal cord becoming taut and then pulling down at the base, base of the meninges of the, of the, in the brain, and that, that tension causes severe pain, and that causes a, a positive Brudzinski sign. Uh, the other one is um, Koenig sign. Uh, Koenig sign is when you raise the, raise the legs, um, the knees to the chest, and then you um, uh, you will have um, severe you know pain as well when you bring the knees up to the chest, um, and that's Koenig sign, and that's just you know another really important thing to know. <clears throat> so um, some other important things to know: um, doing spinal tap. I can't believe I didn't put a slide in here on this, but I need to. I'm going to add this one in. Where do you do a spinal tap? Where do you do a spinal tap? You know, in the spine, okay, yeah, spine. You do a spinal tap between L3 and L4, and we have a picmonic on that to help you learn that as well, um, between L3 and L4. And when you're doing uh, any kind of CSF evaluation, whether you're looking, so you're looking for meningitis, um, you want to make sure you, um, you know, you, it's between L3 and L4. Um, the patient needs to lie flat afterwards. And um, when you're taking that CSF fluid, you want to make sure you number those tubes. That's really important, uh, fundamental topic as well. Next, we're going to move on to cerebral vascular accidents, CVAs, cerebral, cerebral vascular attacks, strokes, whatever you want to call it today. I'm actually, I'm not even sure what they're calling it today, but you should know each of these. CVA, cerebral vascular attack, cerebral vascular incident, uh, cerebral vascular accident, stroke, um, or whatever a new term that somebody coins and puts on it next week. The idea of stroke is a stroke is a stroke. Now, you need to know that there are different types of strokes. That's what's important. Um, so as we have here in our slide for you, we, you need to know that there's a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, hemorrhagic stroke, which is a, a bleeding. Um, and bleeding, so anytime we have these vessels in our brain, there's lots of vessels inside there, and those vessels um, eventually sometimes can just spring a little leak, pew, and when they spring a little leak, they leak into the brain. And because the brain's this nice closed cavity, unless, you know, you have air in there or whatever, which I know some people, I know some people that I really believe just have air in there. Um, you spring that leak and that there's nowhere for that pressure to go because it, so then it causes a lot of damage because of the pressure and then causes, you know, uh, signs and symptoms. Now, the number one cause of those sporadic leaks, of course, is hypertension, prolonged hypertension, um, can cause an aneurysm to bust or it can cause just a hemorrhagic stroke leak. Um, that is really the most common cause. Now, the other example are ischemic strokes. Now, ischemia means, you know, death of tissue, right? Um, so you've got to remember um, ischemic strokes. Um, and ischemic strokes we show here as our eye ski mask. Cute little character um, so you can remember it. Now, hold on to your pants for a minute because I'm going to explain this to you so you're never going to miss this really important concept. What's the difference between thrombotic and embolic? Ah, every time 
I used to mess this up all the time. And then I figured out a way to remember it. And now I'm going to share it with you. <clears throat> How do you remember thrombotic? Well, I remember that thrombotic or a thrombus starts with a T. And a thrombus is something that forms right there with a T, right there. So it means it forms in a vessel, slowly forms over time, and it, it's right there in a vessel. So if I said it's going to form inside of this vessel, I'm going to say, well, it's right there. There it is forming. It's a T right there with a T, thrombus, thrombotic, thrombolic stroke, something that forms right there. And it's going to occlude eventually because it's going to keep building up, building up, building up until it blocks off the blood supply. Formed right there and it just kept getting bigger until it blocked it off. Now the other type, my favorite, is an embolic stroke. So an embolic stroke, how do we remember this one? Hold on to your pants. <clears throat> an embolic stroke is something, it starts with E, right? E, I like E. Now an embolic stroke, I want you to remember, a thrombus forms right there, but an embolus, it breaks free. Right, breaks free. E E. It breaks free and breaks free goes through the blood vessel and then lands somewhere and causes an occlusion. Now, where does it cause an occlusion? It causes an occlusion at a bifurcation. What's a bifurcation? Well, it's a split. That's where one big artery gets smaller and turns into two smaller arteries. Kind of like a pipe system, you know, in a house, you got the big giant main that splits off into two tiny ones and splits off um, even more to go to smaller pipes. But remember, thrombotic or thrombus forms right there with a T, and it forms right there slow over time, building and building and building until it, it just breaks, it, it stops blood flow. And what causes that? Well, atherosclerosis, of course. You know, you, you like eating cheeseburgers, which I love cheeseburgers. I can't stop eating them. Um, then it's, you're going to end up with atherosclerosis. Now, an embolus, an emboli, embolic stroke, is when something breaks free, then it breaks free with all those E's, free, an embolic, embolic, or embolus breaks free, and it travels through, and then it lands somewhere else and, and, uh, and causes, a, uh, causes a blood flow, Bro bla ah, blood flow, I can't even talk, <laughs> causes blood flow to stop moving. Um, that's really how you can remember that. What's the big cause here is usually atrial fibrillation. So, you know, the heart chambers, the top one's just kind of quivering, not really doing anything, not moving. And so we have blood stasis. And every time we have stasis, we form clots. And what happens when those clots form right there? Well, then they break free and they land and go somewhere else, usually causing um, a uh, stroke. And that's, that's not what we don't want that to happen. I mean, that's never a good thing. And that's why those patients have to be on anticoagulant therapy. Very, very important. So <clears throat> as we move forward, the next thing I want you to really understand, I want you to understand this really good concept, it's really important, left versus right hemisphere strokes. Um, I used to really have a lot of trouble with this. Um, and then you know what happened? I just had an epiphany. And then I didn't have to study ever again. Just kidding. So with left and right hemisphere strokes, it's really important to remember the two different types. And we can classify them totally differently so that you can remember them for the long term. Um, the important thing here is that you can um, understand right away that every stroke, no matter what, um, whether you have a left-sided stroke or a right-sided stroke, the weakness is in the opposite side. So if we say that straight away, that's all the time, then that's the way it is. So if you have a left-sided stroke, you're going to be weak on the right. If you have a right-sided stroke, you're going to be weak on the left. You should just memorize that right away. The weakness is on the opposite side. Then we can theme um, the left side of strokes versus the right side of strokes. And they're very opposite, and they're very easy to remember once we characterize them right here in beautiful Pygmonic land. I love Pygmonic land. It's such a happy place. Um, I just wish they'd paid me more than nickels. That would be really nice. Yeah. So think about that. Could be getting paid in nickels. Left-sided strokes. Left-sided, I want you to remember left-sided um, hemisphere strokes as patients who are slow and cautious. Um, they often have depression. They're very anxious because they're aware of what's going on. And I want you to imagine them, I compare them usually to a sloth. 
And yeah, I know that's not really fair, but that's the example that I like to use. Um, I like to really just compare them kind of a, to a sloth. They're very slow moving, looking around, being very careful because they know something is wrong. They're aware that the right side of their body is not moving. They're aware something's wrong. Uh, they're just they get very depressed they're upset they're anxious they're anxious but they're, they're just very cautious because of all this and that's really really important because um, um, people who have left-sided hemisphere strokes can't express themselves and that's really um, that's really what is important they can't express what's going on with them and because of this they may not be able to write they may not be able to speak um, they may have a gra a graphia, an inability to. Sorry, my nose itches. <sighs> so they may have a graphia, an inability to write, um, but they also may have aphasia, um, specifically expressive aphasia, where they're unable to speak as well. So they're basically um, they know that something is wrong, but they can't tell anyone, um, and they can't write it to express and tell anyone that hey, you know, I'm something's going on. They just you are perceiving it from them, and they're having a lot of trouble explaining what's going on. And you see this, and they're, they, because of this, become very cautious of what's going on. They get depressed, and they're very anxious, and whatnot. Now, let's contrast this with right-sided stroke patients. Now, right-sided stroke patients. Right-sided stroke patients are not in their right mind. And that's You've probably heard that before. Let me explain. So I like to explain right-sided uh, uh, stroke patients as they're unable to um, perceive the environment. They're unable to accept things. And uh, because they can't really tell what's going on, they're like crazy animals. They're like wild animals, okay? They're not in their right mind. So mm -hmm. these patients may not, uh, they're not able to recognize anyone's faces. Uh, they, they just can't perceive and they may be completely impulsive and they may have wild personality changes. Every patient is not the same. That's really important for you to know. But, you know, it is important um, to know that they basically may lose their ability to judge. They may not know who you are. They may not be able to recognize their own family members. And because of this, they're just, they're, they're, they're not in their right mind. Um, so they're, you know, screaming and yelling and flailing and um, they're completely out of it. And uh, of course, it's because they can't perceive their environment um, and they lose the ability to judge. So contrast the two. Left-sided stroke patients, Left-sided hemisphere stroke patients obviously have opposite side weakness, right-sided weakness, left-right. I, you know, I, I always get my left and right mixed up. I do the little hand thing, but I can't do it on the camera because I think it'll be backwards. Whatever. Left-sided stroke patients, slow, cautious. They can't express themselves. Imagine a left-sided stroke patient's kind of like a little lazy sloth. L for left-sided stroke. L for lazy sloth. And they're slow. That's what's important. They're not lazy, but they're just slow. Um, they're very cautious. They become very depressed because they can't express themselves. Poor sloth can't express themselves, can't write, can't speak. Poor sloth. Then you have right-sided stroke patients. Those patients are not in their right mind at all. Um, they can't, they can't um, perceive anything that's going on in their environment. Um, they can't recognize people very often. They have tonal hearing loss problems, and they just have no judgment. And because of this, they have personality changes, and they're com maybe completely disoriented about what's going on. They may not know where they're at. They may think they're the Queen of England. So we just touched on a lot of the disorders you have to know in the nervous system. There are lots more. Of course, we know that as well. And a lot of fundamental concepts that you have to be able to recognize and understand how to treat and most importantly, prioritize what's going on. What you need to know is Pygmonic. We have everything covered. You can go in, check us out, view all of the diseases that we have right here. View the playlist that we've attached with all the Pygmonics you need to know relevant to this lecture.